for the Special Board of Education meeting. It is 6.04, and I'd like to officially call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Nelson. Here. 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 And a quorum is present. The first item on the agenda are pres uh, audience comments, and we have no audience comments. And so we'll move on to recognition. Great. Good. So we have a number of uh, groups to recognize. We're going to start with our Math Bowl participants. I can hear myself. I know. Somebody's watching. I just. Oh, yeah. okay. Somebody's streaming somewhere. Outside. Oh, okay. There we go. It's all good. Oh, that's you now. I can hear you now. Oh. Oh, it's that laptop. <laughs> gotcha. Leonard will. Thanks. Here he comes. There we go. <laughs> Math bowl. Math, Math bowl. bowl. <laughs> That's the, kind of an introduction. That was, yeah. That was really good. Was like a, <laughs> Try a to spice it up. Pause. Yes. And we are really pleased to recognize the 2021-2022 Math Bowl participants. The competition, uh, annual competition, which I have to say has not been in person uh, for two years now, so this was quite a treat to be back having the official math ball. It took place on April 28th and 29th at Prairie State College. There were over 20 schools from grades one through eight competing for the South Cook region. Division A and B placed fourth in their respective divisions. Connor Boyko and Josephine Baxa each received most valuable player awards and Gregory Mitchell earned first place award. I'm going to read the names. But first of all, can we give it a round of applause? Yeah. Yes. Woo. I'll read the names uh, for each division. Uh, division A, which is grades one and two, Emilio Guyton. I think I'm just going to call everyone. Is that okay? Yeah. If you're here, come on up. Uh, Chime OJ, OG, Charles Rude. Mark Perry, Hunter Schaefer, and Jackson Simowich. Division B, it was grades three and four. We have Langston Graham, Charles Bivens, Kyler Jackson, Connor Boyko, Uche Okafor, and Braden Whitmore. Oh, hi, guys. And Division C, grades five and six, we have Josiah Sharp, Munchasio Achara, Yanis Torres, Isaac Hernandez, Zephyr Peters, and Henry Meyer. And Division D, which are grades seven and eight, we have Josephine Baxa. Makai Fox, Alexander Pajeu, Gregory Mitchell, <laughs> Caleb Wilson, and Mahal Reyes.
Thompson and Butler. Right. Butler's fucking crazy. Right. <laughs> Whoa. You snuck in there. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, hi. How are you? Everyone <clears throat> I am uh, pleased to uh, be in front of the board. Uh, we had an amazing season of uh, youngster scholar athletes. Um, we worked hard from day one. We had a goal to uh, have success not only in the classroom and the track, but also in our personal lives. We did uh, meet all goals, and uh, we ended up with the recognition downstate, the state title. I will go ahead and go on script. I believe I'm supposed to read the words. Uh, here we go. <laughs> The Parker Junior High School 8th grade boys track team placed first at the state meet held on May 20th and 21st, 2022. Team members include Joseph Blissett, Stephen Brown, Caden Dixon, Miles Ellis, Xavier Haynes, Ethan Jackson, Jameer Ratliff, Taj Scott, Courtney Smith, Michael Tillman, and Moses Tolliver. The team was coached by Joseph Butler, the tall guy speaking, Katie Garland, Daryl Thompson, and Coach Bennett. Uh, individual highlights include, before I go to the individual highlights, um, we also had some ladies make it downstate. I'm not sure where the camera's at, so I'm going to, tell me y'all. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, we had Janelle um, Robertson go down for the 200 uh, meter dash as an individual. We had uh, Kayla Collier go down for the long jump, as well as a member of the 4x100 meter relay team on the 8th grade level. Janelle also ran the 4x200 uh, relay team for the girls, 7th grade girls. Also on the seventh grade girls team was Mrs. Zoe Ratliff, uh, Aubrey Haley Jones, and uh, Chloe Daniels. That was our four by two relay team that went down. The eighth grade girls uh, led off by Cameron Turner, handed off to uh, Kaya, uh, who gave it to the young uh, Kayla Green, brought home by Miss Peyton Butler. What an amazing last name, not on purpose, but it's just a, <laughs> is what it is. So those are all the youngsters that went downstate. Um, I will now, I believe, hand out certificates to those who are here. And I'll tell stories. Um, Courtney Smith, a young man who started off on the uh, distance team, shame when you coach Butler, he ended up on the sprint team and was an amazing member of the four by two relay as well as the four by four hundred meter relay. Courtney Smith. This next young man has a wonderful first name, Joseph. Uh, Joseph <laughs> Blissett uh, was a member. He was a long jumper who went down state um, in our 4 by 100 meter relay team. Uh, the next young man, Xavier Haynes, had the uh, pleasure and curse of being in my homeroom. Uh, he went down state for our, as a 200 meter relay individual and also a member of the 4 by 200 team, Xavier Haynes. And I believe a straight A student. He got an A on my class, at least. <laughs> uh, another member of my homeroom, uh, Kaden Dixon, uh, is a, wow, this, this young man went downstate for basketball, also downstate for track, uh, strong on the track and fast. His uh, leadoff leg for the 4x400 relay, meter relay team really set the tone, and uh, he also ran on the 4x2 relay. Kaden Dixon. Uh, the second to last gentleman was, I believe, one of Parker's first athletes to go down state for cross country, basketball, and track. Uh, Jameer Ratliff was an all state in the cross country. <laughs> he was a member of the 4x400 meter relay team. He ran against a, 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 ooh, a, a sprinter. Jameer kept up with him, kept us in the race. Um, just uh, fantastic in the classroom and on the track and in the field. Last but not least, maybe the best, uh, a legend, along with Jameer and the others, is a young man, I won't say his name, I'm sure you know it already, he um, was rated number one in the 110 high hurdles, took third in that event, he was ranked, I think, number three in the 400, came roaring down the stretch to be state champion in that race, uh, he anchored the four by 200 meter relay team from fourth place to third place, and took the baton in the mile relay, the four by 400, in second place, and just leisurely said, hi, my friend, I'm gonna go ahead and pass you and win this race. Miles Ellis. <laughs> I would like for all members of the track team, uh, male and female who are in the audience, Josie, come on up, and ladies, come on up for this picture. We appreciate everyone's um, efforts this year and the board for your support for the wonderful, wonderful programs at Parker um, Junior High School at all.
He's going to thank you for a wonderful season. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Just like that crowd. <laughs> oh, you're by yourself over there. I can, but my chair is. Take, take a Janelle's chair. Is it shrinking? I need to work out with you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we do have one additional uh, recognition tonight. I do want to say congratulations to the students and staff at Heather Hill School for being recognized as a Capturing Kids Hearts National Showcase School. Uh, Heather, yeah. <laughs> Heather Hill is one of 377 schools in the country to re receive this designation for their implementation of Capturing Kids Hearts and their focus on connecting with kids in meaningful ways to create a great school environment. Congratulations, Principal Holland. Get a certificate. Congratulations. Thank you. Job well done. The next item on our agenda is the superintendent's report. Well, hello again, everyone. I hope everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend, that you were able to spend a few moments kind of remembering the military members who made the ultimate sacrifice for our country over the Memorial Day weekend and holiday. Uh, it's been a few weeks since our most recent board meeting, but we're all together to celebrate the graduation of our eighth grade students from Parker Junior High School. A, a very big thank you has to go out to Ms. Crawford, our Parker principal, her assistant principals, uh, Ms. Wisniewski and Ms. Peacock, uh, her assistant, Ms. Schroeder, and I know scores of other staff members at Parker who just really put a lot of hard work and parents into making sure that the night ran smoothly, that it was uh, engaging for all. And so I thank you for organizing such a wonderful experience for the kids. Unfortunately, we had to, you know, while the graduation started our great week of activities, we did have to schedule our end of the year party because of inclement weather. So we'll look forward to getting back together in August for our back to school uh, celebration with, with the community. Uh, but this week brings us preparations for Summer Academy and we're hosting professional development uh, sessions for those teachers on Wednesday and Thursday of this week ahead of our official Summer Academy launch next Monday, uh, June 6th. This Thursday evening we're also hosting a virtual parent orientation uh, for Summer Academy from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So I hope we get a great turnout for that event. As a reminder, we have uh, 700 students right now heading to Summer Academy. It is uh, an incredible number. Uh, it's a great investment in our community and in, in our school district. And we're cer certainly thankful to the Board of Education for the vision to stand behind such a program. I'm really looking forward to seeing the kids and the staff on Monday. And we'll have uh, several updates about Summer Academy throughout the summer ahead of our fall you know, full recap. I know that our Summer Academy principal, Ms. Avina McNeil, and our assistant principal, uh, Ms. Pam Panazzo, are ready for the challenge. I've seen the materials that they're preparing for professional development, and, and I know how seriously they're taking this work. So I know that the program is in good hands, and we'll have a lot of updates and information coming to the board over the next couple of months. But that's the end of my report. Thank you. My pleasure. Any questions? OK. Um, let's see. The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including personal report 22-019, the FOIA request, and the donation of a water filling station to Heather Hill School. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Lanier. 
Yes. Krause? Yes. 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 Yes, and the motion passes. Next item on the agenda is discussion A, which is the tentative 2022-23 budget. Welcome, Fran LaBella. Hello. Okay. I'm also going to take you through tentative close, and that's actually going to be probably the larger part of the conversation. So let's start with tentatively closing. Hello. Are we on? Court, are we? There you go. I'm getting used to. I walk. Right. <laughs> um, all right. On the revenue side, um, local property taxes are actually in much higher this year than we had anticipated. Um, a huge part of that is from higher collections for the current year. Um, a second part of that is a lot less um, property tax refunds than we've seen in the last couple of years. So the combination has been a good one. Um, we are positive to budget by almost a million dollars, about $900,000. Um, remember that number because later on when I tell you what our estimate year end is going to be, that's, that's the huge piece that's going to play into that. Um, we still have an overall collection rate of 94.4% on the 2020 levy, and so far we're 45, about 45.5% 45 in on the 2021 levy. Okay? Um, and again, that includes about, there's about $435,000 in prior year refunds. So that's $435,000 going the wrong direction. Um, but that is lower um, than the $558,000 that we had last year. And I'll show you a slide later on where you can see what our trend has been. Um, our state revenues, um, where right now we're actual to date at about $8.4 million. Um, but when we see the May and the June and plus the property tax relief grant we should see in June as well. We should get to that $10 million. That is our estimate. Click it, Court. You're going to have to drive. So here's that chart I was talking about. So if you take a look at um, those second prior plus and so on, that's really where we've been seeing those great big dips in the refunds. Um, you can see 2019 was huge, and they've been kind of leveling back off again. They're still, we still have a decent amount of refunds, but they're significantly better than the levels that we saw in 2019 and 2020. On the federal side, right now we have about $3 million. Um, that includes about $1 million, $912,000 from COVID funds. Um, we probably will not see much more federal monies come in until after the close of the fiscal year because the next round of expenditure reports, a lot of these grants are given to us on a reimbursement level. So once they're expended, then we send them a report and they send us mo um, monies back. So the next reports aren't due until July for the close at June 30. So this is probably where we'll end the year, maybe a few thousand dollars higher based on some smaller grants that come through. Um, on the expenditure side, okay, you definitely have clicked a few. Okay. So let's go one more back. One more back. There you go. Um, so for year to date total, right now we're budgeted at 37.2. We actually have in 35.3. I believe we're going to be coming pretty close onto budget, if not a little bit higher based on um, local revenues and where we are with the state funds coming in. So that should bring us, like I said, at about that 37, 38 million dollar mark at the year end for revenues. Okay. On salary side, 
Um, we have budgeted $20.5 million. Right now, we're actually spent at 16.5, but remember, we run a whole bunch of summer payrolls at the end of June. So you are going to see that. We're expecting a positive variance of about half a million dollars, 400,000, give or take. Um, but I need, to, I need to, some of that 400,000 may be eaten up by summer school because it's a much larger program than we've run in the past. So we are, we've already blown that, that budget on salary. So I'm gonna have to adjust that budget some. But within that 400,000 variance, I'm gonna be able to, to pay for it within your current budget. It's just gonna be shifting monies around. Um, back one step. Um, your, on the benefit side, Again, we have a lot of payrolls that still should be run. We are at $3.8 million, and our budget is about $5 million. I am expecting about a half a million dollar and a positive variance there, okay? No. Um, for services, our budget is $6 million, $6.3 million. We actually have spent about $5 million. Again, we're probably at about a half a million dollar positive variance on this one. Um, on the supply line, we have 2.6 million budgeted. We have 2.1 million actually expended. Um, we'll have some, some supply still trickling in in these last couple of months, but we'll, we'll be on the positive side on this one as well. Capital outlay, um, we had budgeted a million dollars. We've actually spent 921,000. We are in the process of completing the Flossmoor Hills Pre-K Playground. If you haven't been by Flossmoor Hills, the um, equipment is actually in. We're just waiting to pour the, the surface. Um, so that's very exciting. So we will have some expenditures coming out. So we should be at about where we budgeted um, on capital outlay for the year. Um, on other objects, a lot of that is, it's our bond and interest payments and it's um, special education for students placed outside of the school district. Um, we had budgeted 2.9 million, we're at 2.4 right now. I figure we're gonna come pretty much right in on budget on there. Um, on our non-cap equipment, um, our budget was 218,000. We're actually at 456,000 right now, which is an unfavorable variance of about a quarter of a million dollars. This is mostly for, remember, we purchased Chromebooks that the state is then going to reimburse us for. So this looks like a negative, but we'll actually get the money back. We'll have a, re a reimbursement there. Um, so for a total budget of $38.6 million on the expenditure side right now, we're at $31.4 million. I am expecting that this year we'll come in at about between one and one and a half million dollars to the positive. And most of that being from the additional revenues from property taxes, the, the less um, refunds that we've been seeing. So this is a good thing for us this year. Okay. So now let's talk about the um, tentative budget. These are just revenues. On the estimate for 2022, this is what we kind of just went through where we expect ending this year. Um, in your next year's your tentative budget for 2023. We are anticipating property taxes to be pretty flat. That was anticipated, that was, that's what our intention was. Remember when we did, we put on CPI, we let property tax relief grant expire, then we put on the new property tax relief grant with all with the intention of trying to keep taxes relatively flat from last fiscal, last levy year to this levy year. Um, after that, this next year, you're gonna have a 5% CPI. So I have put a 5% CPI onto that property tax levy and then moved back down to about 3% 3, 3 levy thereafter for forecasting. Okay, now these are all decisions we're gonna to have to make, but those are the assumptions built into this tentative budget. On the other local revenue side, um, that's just really a lot of miscellaneous things that actually you know, add up to one, one million dollars. Um, on the state side, your evidence-based funding that is your old grant plus the new property tax relief grant. And not knowing where we're going to be with the state, to be conservative, we have left that flat for next year and all years moving forward, because we have not seen any, any numbers coming out of the state yet. I actually think it's going to be higher, but just for, to be conservative right now, we've kept that flat for tentative. Um, on 
the federal side, what you see there is the estimate for this year. Then next year includes ESSER 3, half of ESSER 3. 2024 includes the other half of ESSER 3. And then 2025, you'll see it drop off. That's where the ESSER funds dry up. So they have been removed from the tentative budget pro, uh, forecast. Then moving forward, they're flat. So they would just be our regular Title I, Title II, Title III IDEA monies. Okay. Um, so that puts us at about $40 million for tentative revenue for next year. Okay, Court. On the expenditure side, salaries and benefits are built in based on the collective bargaining agreement. Okay, so you're looking at about 3.5% increase on salaries. You're looking at about a 3.75% increase on health insurance because we know what the rates are. Okay. Um, we did bump up a lot of the um, projected increase on purchase services and supplies and so on based on CPI right now and knowing that we are probably going to be paying a lot more for things like electricity and heat and everything else that is oil-based, which means paper, which I can't get right now. So, yeah. Um, it's coming in at about a $40.3 million of expenditures. That includes the um, capital outlay for the playgrounds that are to be done this summer, as well as the asphalt projects over at Flossmore Hills and Heather Hill. It also includes that half of the ESSER 3 funds. So if you take a look um, at the numbers for 2023 and 2024, your bottom line expenditures are both at about $40 million. And then in 2025, you'll see it drop down to 39 and a half. 40. What we did was when we pulled out the revenue side of Esther 3, we also pulled out all the associated benefits or all the associated expenditures with Esther 3. So any of the positions that are being paid for under Esther 3 all go away on this tentative budget for projections going forward. So those are the big decisions that you're going to have to make. But right now, I took it out of both sides. Okay. Fran, just real quick, and that's around half a million. That is around $1.2 million a year. You are going to see that it only looks like a half a million because you've got to remember all your other expenses are going up. Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. So you're growing at probably about a million dollars a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Off the top of your head, do you know how many positions that is or not? If you don't, that's fine. I, I'm just, I'm just thinking that. Somewhere in the range of seven. I want to say five reading, five math specialists, an AVID teacher, uh, an SEL, yeah. two SEL coaches. Two SEL coaches, so yeah, seven, <clears throat> eight. Okay, go ahead, Court. So when you put it all together, what do you get? Um, 2023 right now has an estimated deficit of $172,000, which to me is flat, because I can close that with my eyes closed. Okay. So you're essentially running, when I just use grand terms, a balanced budget for next year. And moving forward, you will see next year, the projected 2024 actually comes in at $1.3 million higher. But remember, at this point in time, I have absolutely no construction built into this budget for that point, okay? Um, and really, every year thereafter, there's some small deficits, but nothing significant. Court, go ahead, throw the next one. What this does is show you what your fund balances do this year, next year, and the years after. So essentially, we are flat. We are running what I consider that we should be able to run balanced budgets. Now, what you decide to do with fund balances or not with fund balance, with positions, with not, those are all the hard decisions that we're going to need to be making in the next couple of years. Um, and some of them this year, some of them next and the year after, but that's kind of the, the general game plan. Questions, concerns, things that you want me to delve into deeper when I give you your final. So here's the next plan. 
this is your overall based on major macro <coughs> assumptions. My staff and I will now dive into the micro line by line, person by person, detail by detail. And we will put the nice big old binder together for you and you will receive that at the July board meeting. You will then have a month to review it. My, the finance committee will meet between that time to go over everything, what we're gonna present to you and make sure that they're comfortable with it before we bring it to you in August. In August, I will present you the full budget in micro, okay, a little more detail than what you got tonight. Then you'll be up for a budget hearing and acceptance in September. Okay. Question? Not right now. We good? Okay. Then next meeting, you'll just approve the tentative budget. Really, all this does is give us the ability to continue to spend money, which means salaries and benefits and the things that we need to start getting the next school year up, and the formal budget will be approved in September. So I guess it's not a question, but it's just something I'm thinking about, that, that eventually I, I want to see how it plays out. What happens if we don't want, we want to keep all those positions and, and all the bells and whistles from ESSER? Mm -hmm. um, I can absolutely start running you some yeah. idea. What I was going to do is put kind of a below the line ideas of all the things that you've been paying for that would go away with that funding. Yeah. And I can give you an idea of money and then that'll just be a, you know, a negative to the bottom line. Okay. And that'd be simple to do. We'll bring yeah. that back. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Thank you, Fran. Okay. Thank you. I'm not going anywhere. So. Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, next item, long range planning committee. <clears throat> Swap out the, the clickers. <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a group presentation tonight. Uh, we do have Mike Eichhorn from Walt <laughs> joining us. Mike, good to see you. Uh, but this is our first large-scale presentation to the Board of Education about the work of the Long Range Planning Committee uh, that started several months ago. Uh, there's a couple of pieces that we'll want to touch on here. We'll talk about kind of the conversations and the processes and design criteria and really how we got to some of the options. Um, we're encouraging questions tonight. Uh, we're encouraging, you know, comments, additions, revisions, et cetera. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I'd like to preview before we get into the presentation because we're specifically looking for any feedback that you have around these, and these are listed in the board report. But really, it's focusing on ideas if you need any additional community input, the qu specific questions that the board has regarding funding, financial models, things that we can send to the finance committee as we're working through this process. If there are other priorities that we need to consider that aren't up here um, or any additional projects, et cetera. So any feedback on this is good feedback. There's still a lot of work left to be done, uh, but at this point it's probably prudent to come to the board to have that initial conversation. We started with our strategic plan and our portrait of a graduate. Oh, thanks, Scott, for fixing that. Make sure you want to hit two forward. It's almost working. Now it's just <laughs> finicky. There we go. Awesome. Perfect. So we really started with our strategic plan and kind of a portrait of a graduate as we were thinking about those de design criteria and just what those mean as we're making large scale decisions. I think the board has done a good job of kind of aligning our board reports to the strategic plan and et cetera as we're making these decisions and, and Fran just shared the budget information. We know that uh, as our money goes into supporting the district and the community, it has an impact on kids. And so we really kind of start with that as our focus. Um, you know, you, yep. So just, this kind of recaps the presentation. I'm not going to go through that, but in a moment we'll hit on those design criteria. We'll get into, as I mentioned, the different models. Mike, you can go forward to the next one. And we'll talk about where we landed on general committee recommendations and just what it's gonna mean as we're doing the work. There we go. 
So again, these are the criteria that we used, we identified may, early on, just a couple that we'll kind of pick out for you, you know, on that second list, you know, adequately sized staff support spaces and a dedicated lounge, right? Kind of a general piece, but as, we, as you look at the ideas that have come back, the options, some of those fit, you know, certainly into how we were looking at each of the different projects that we identified. Remember, we identified four. Uh, the Heather Hill office, the Western Avenue office, uh, the Parker Junior High cafetorium, and uh, classroom upgrades. Now, there can be certainly other projects that we add to this, but those are the four that kind of landed in the orbit of the committee. Um, any questions on the criteria? Thoughts? Again, they kind of present an umbrella of work over the district, and they do apply to a lot of those. And when you see the projects, you'll see that you know, some we were able to hit more than others, uh, but all the projects definitely kind of connected to the criteria that we presented you know, pretty early on in the process. Yeah. Great. That's good. Mike, is this still me or are we kicking over to you on this one? Oh, this is me. All right, perfect. So we talked about, um, if you remember, we're gonna, we have two plans. We have our facilities maintenance plan, which is all the work that has to be done. It's roofs, boilers, all those different pieces. Um, kind of comes down to life safety and code compliance. Um, as Scott, we do our you know, walkthroughs every year with the ROE. We're identifying pieces that we need to, to address. Um, but again, that's that 39-page uh, facilities document that lists everything from replacing, you know, half the Normandy roof to um, the air conditioning rooftop units at Flossmoor Hills. It just really covers all of those pieces that at some point will come to their, the end of their mechanical lives, and we'll have to make a decision on um, kind of changing those as well. We did have a couple of other criteria that we looked at, and these were based on funding projects that we know are kind of hanging out there that have been a challenge for us, particularly um, the Western Avenue um, entrance and exit when it comes to arrival and dismissal. Um, and at Heather Hill, we have an issue with bathrooms that was identified pretty early on, just primarily access to uh, multi-student bathrooms, which we don't have in one, one wing. And then I think this is a pretty common refrain in most uh, older school buildings. Storage is certainly a concern. Teachers don't have a lot of room to put materials and Chromebooks and all those different pieces. So as we covered, the initial criteria, design criteria that we identified, obviously we had the pieces from the facilities maintenance plan and then the other pieces that we identified as we were talking, kind of working through that process kind of came up here as well. Still? There we go, Courtney. Uh, you can drive, Courtney, perfect. And then finally, as we kind of got into, you know, looking at um, cla classroom pieces, you know, we talked about this is um, the kind of the classroom upgrades, the lighting, the flexible seating, um, changing flooring pieces uh, that'll exist. Um, if we do have additional funds to look at flexible seating um, and what that looks like in, in the various spaces, whether it's building out um, and revising and renovating other areas in the school, certainly looking at the classrooms as we have, um, seating and, and desk replacements that are coming up in the future. And then we will have to make some decisions on the renovation and upgrade side as we think about what is that basic classroom that we want to guarantee in every building. Right now we do have some smart boards. We have some, we have a lot of smart boards. I don't mean to be um, kind of limiting there. We have mostly smart boards installed in our classrooms. We do have projectors, but again, it's making commitments on as those smart boards fail, are we going to refresh them? Are we going to provide the training? Are those going to be a great tool for us? You know, sound systems, all those different pieces. And again, it's all money dependent. And so as we're talking about the different projects that we'll see tonight and how those get prioritized, there's a financial cost and we know that we cannot do all of them. And that's why this plan is so important because we'll have a list of things that we have to do. We will have our list of things that we want to do. And then we'll have a list of things that we could not do yet, but we want to plan for those. And I think that's the value of having a clearly identified plan and process. It'll take us out five or 10 years. We can continually check in on it. But also as we're making decisions about staffing positions, other large expenditures, we can kind of keep in mind those other projects that we want to accomplish in order to improve the schools. Great. 
Uh, just one other piece here that we've identified. Actually, not two more. Yeah, one more. Um, on the programmatic side, we've talked a number of, um, I know that we've talked here, we've certainly talked at the buildings, uh, particularly hitting at Parker Junior High and the setup of the kitchen, but also the larger issue is the lack of kitchens at the elementary schools and the impact that that has, well, on our food service vendors, but ultimately on the quality and types of food that we, that we can provide to our students. Since we don't have kitchens at the buildings, we're limited on the number of vendors who can who will actually bid for the services, and when that happens, you know, we're kind of stuck with what can be provided, and we you know, think we have a, a hard-working partner uh, who, to provide our food service, but certainly as you have more competition, there's an opportunity to look at different offerings, uh, not only for the students, but um, you know, to take care of uh, breakfast, lunch, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, so then you come to your 10-year long-range maintenance stuff, what we like to call, what I like to call, the not sexy stuff. Nothing exciting. Go ahead, Court. Um, all the things that happen behind the walls, all the things that we just have to do in order to make this place continue to run, continue to be safe. It's pipes, it's, it's roofs, it's uh, asphalt, it's, you know, it's those kinds of things. Also included, though, are playground replacements, which obviously we have already started. Um, there's a lot of things you're going to find in here that we've already started. Um, the parking lot asphalt improvements. Obviously, we're doing a huge, you know, asphalt um, repair work at Flossmoor Hills and Heather Hill this year. Um, on top of that, we continue to do our seal coating um, on an every other year basis. All the things that we're trying to do to extend the life of some of the things you're going to see in here. Um, you are going to find, though, that a lot of the items that are in that big thing do fall under life safety. Um, and so we will use life safety funds for those, but we'll kind of get into that in the next slide. Um, I just want to point out that there is a lot of, lot of work in here. Our, our buildings are not young. And additionally, the work that you see there and in those, those numbers does not include this building. Um, so it really is probably a little larger than what you're seeing up there, although there are some things that are going to come off, like we, you know, we already said, you know, parking lots, some asphalt. You know, there's some things that at the time of the facility, we've already started making some improvements with, with our, our funds. So keep in mind, this list continues to be fluid, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, but it is at least about $11 million over the next five years, about 18 over the next 10. Go ahead, Court. So here's my slide. I get one slide, <laughs> and here it is. So let's talk about what kind of money we have. You have bonds rolling off within the next year and a half. Okay. If we were to simply replenish those bonds, you end up with about nine and a half million dollars over 10 years. The largest you can go over is 20 years. I don't recommend you going to 20. I don't even recommend you going to 15. And my example is going to be, how old do you think that the new addition at Parker is? Most people tell me, oh, that thing's at least 20 years. No, that thing is as old as those bonds are. And they haven't rolled off yet. And already we're looking at it like it's a relic of the past. So I would not recommend you bond out further than 10 years because in 10 years, you're going to want to do something else and you won't have the funding capacity to do it. So you can put on bonds to replace the ones that are out there, about nine and a half million dollars. Additionally, every year we levy for life safety. There is a fund out there, life safety, the only thing that we can use those property tax dollars that we levied for that purpose is for that purpose. We'll have about $2 million. That life safety survey is up next year. Next year? Next year. Um, that we'll be redoing that life safety survey. After that, you have a small period of time, basically a three-year window to get the work done that we identify in that life safety survey for the priority one items that are crucial. That money is earmarked for those projects and those projects will be in those not six not sexy list that we just went through okay so you do have some funds to do that so think about two million dollars there additionally you have fund balances 
we just went through tentative budget. Your fund balances are going to be in the 30 to $33 million range if we continue the way we are going. I put up here five to six million dollars. It's a very comfortable number because I want to save you guys some room for when you start talking about what you have been purchasing with SR3 funds and what you want to keep. Okay? So that gives you a total of $17 million to play with at this point. Now, that is not saying that you couldn't, if you thought that the community would stand a referendum, that is your prerogative. That would get you beyond the non-referendum bonds. But without going to voters, that's your budget, unless you want to dip further into fund balance. Okay. What percentage of that existing fund balance, what was the percentage that we as a board, and I think it was before, we had a range, no yeah. Policy. There's a range, and I want to say it's 33%, I think we said. Something I think like we said so we'd be comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. This would still keep you, even with trying to figure out ESSER 3, would keep you well in the 50% 50, 50 range. OK. OK. I did not dip below the 50% range on anything that I was suggesting at this yeah. point. If you want to talk about more than that, we can talk about more than that. But this was, uh, I am very comfortable here. Sure. This, this is where I'm, I sleep very well at night on this, okay? I think quick, there's just so many unknowns. Quick question. Mm -hmm. so, so here we're saying 17 million for a 10 year to spend, correct? Correct. And you're estimating closer to 18 million for 10 years? I'm saying, we're saying on that life safety now, well, it's that list that we got from E. EMG, I never get the letters right, from EMG. Some of the things have already been done. Okay. Some of the things are included in other projects. There's mm -hmm. overlap within here. And there's some things that we look at and go, they said it needs to be done in three years. Pfft, it's fine. It can move on for a little longer than that. So you're going to find overlapping items, and you're going to find items that we're <coughs> looking at going, yeah, could, could that little crack be fixed yeah is it really that necessary no is, is, is the world going to come to an end if we don't do this probably not so it's finding that happy medium the survey itself gets us to 18 million do I think we need to do 18 million dollars worth of work right here right now in the next 10 years I think we could probably stretch a lot of it so and how much consideration was given to the ever-changing environment of cost of there Good are escalators. Services. There are escalators built into here. I will tell you that they are not in the environment we're living right now. Escalators. Mike will be best to talk to about that because he's the one who's been through that list. But there are escalators built in. Like I said, it's not what we're seeing right now in this environment. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. From I guess my, my concern is not just the overall um, CPI increases that we're seeing, but it's more specific to specific projects. Absolutely. When you get into supply chain issues, mm -hmm. you're seeing cost on a, a, a job or a service that is substantially more than what it was. Absolutely. I was talking to a, a contractor a the other ago. day who told me that rock went up 50%. Right. So things of that nature is where my concern is, and I, mm -hmm. I don't know if 4% is sufficient to address that yeah it's definitely going to be one of the things we're going to need to consider okay. thanks The last thing that I'd want to say is that the bonds start tapering off this year, okay? We could potentially put off a bond sale for one more year, and that might be in our best interest. I am working closely with PMA, our, our financial consultants there, 
Um, I, I got some updated numbers from them as recently as last week, and we're scheduled to have a conversation next month um, as to when it would be best to do this, whether we should wait another month or not with what interest rates are doing or not doing, and we wish we had a crystal ball, but we don't. But if we were to put on, if we were to sell this year to put on for the next year's levy, you would pretty well have to make a determination that you wanted to sell this year by October in order for us to do all of the pieces that are required under statute and to have the information ready to go to the Cook County Clerk's Office in order to have those bonds put on um, for that levy year. So we have to have that filed with them by March 1st of next year and there's a whole timeline and things that have to take place. So you're gonna have to probably have a decision made by October of this year if we're gonna go out for sale on bonds this year. I would absolutely recommend that we did the same way we did last year or last time, um, which was a competitive sale um, you still have a very strong bond rating, and I anticipate you will continue to have that bond rating because you do have fi good fund balances, and Standard & Poor love those fund balances. Um, so I, I expect that we will maintain that, that bond rating. Um, so a competitive sale definitely would be in the district's best interest. Okay. In 2019, we updated Board Policy 420 that put the range for year end fund balance at 30 to 50 percent of annual operating expenses. Thanks. Thank you, Fran. Uh, the, the committee has done a tremendous job, a lot of work over the last uh, months or so, um, pulling together a lot of data about the existing buildings, walking the buildings, tours, uh, meeting, and really looking at how to align the facilities with the, the vision and mission of the school district, and as well as the, the needs of each of the buildings. Um, so as Dr. Smith uh, originally, you know, when we started this presentation, he talked about the d design criteria. And that's very important because as we look at projects, how do they align with that design criteria? So the criteria such as the, the, the four, really, the community identity, site, and safety, classroom modernizations, and programmatic offerings. So each of these projects start to address those criteria that the Long Range Planning Committee developed. Um, so the, the first um, project here, and these are priority projects, there's uh, basically four of them that the committee identified. Um, at Western Avenue, uh, there's a need at the front um, entry for security. Uh, currently, there's not the correct uh, sequence of lockdown, tiers of security. Uh, while it's not completely unsafe, it's not, it's not ideal. Uh, there's also need for additional space at the front entry uh, to address that um, uh, nurse and the quantity of uh, student service uh, offices, as well as uh, music, uh, band, and orchestra uh, is being addressed as well in this option. And both of these options have different price tags, which we'll go over later. So the and this also addresses the um, bathroom needs that um, Dr. Smith had mentioned. Um, and then the second option, which we'll look at here. Uh, so option one, this is the, the site plan showing how it fronts the, uh, the, the building. And there was concerns that the community might um, not uh, maybe be receptive of the adding on to a, to a you know, kind of a historical looking building, okay? So the committee asked us, can you go back and look at how, what that would look like? And so we did some renderings of what it could look like to add on to the front of the building because there was a concern by the, community, by the committee on that. Go to the next one. So here we're showing a couple different versions. Again, it's really just taking, you know, contextually matching what's there essentially. And these are just three different options. So option two, uh, which uh, also addresses the security need at the front of the building, um, but in this case, it extends and, uh, uh, extends and renovates the main office into an existing classroom at the front of the building. So this one you would not have to add on to the front, but you do need to add on to the back of the building. And also by adding on the back, you're obviously taking up more real estate to the back of the building. Uh, so that would be a, 
if you were to compare the two, that's how you compare them. One is you know, taking the real estate in the front, and then the one in the back, which is currently recessed space. So are those options one and option two? And then how is that different from one C and one B? Uh, the one A, B, and C is just the front of the building, the different, um, uh, if you could go back to that. Fascia is It's velvet. just the, the difference in the, the roof color and the fascia. Oh. It's like, the, it's like one of those games where you try to figure out what's, what's different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But now that you said, and now I can see. Okay. Yeah, okay, so if you go to 1A, I probably should have went with more detail. Okay, so 1A have, has the canopy coming yeah. out more into the sidewalk. So the flying you know, soffits, all that. Kind of yeah. a, a, I more see of a, now. a place okay. to wait under the weather. The second one pushes it more flush to the building. Okay. Um, and then the third one um, changes the, the color tone of the, the roof to make yeah. it more... Um, okay. I see it now. Yeah, less striking. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so option two um, re reworks the back of the building. Uh, there was a need for additional bathrooms there. Um, there was a, a question about adding a kitchen. Um, and so this option addresses that. Um, it is more expensive than the first one. And the, the negative, again, is that it's pushing back and it's taking space from the recess um, area. And you can go to the next slide to see that. Next one. So you'll see how it comes off the back of the building there. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So the second priority project from the committee was to redo the uh, main office and security vestibule at Heather Hill. And option one reuses existing space and reconfigures it. So. In this case, we're taking up uh, approximately two classrooms to, um, uh, to put a new reception, series of offices, new lounge, and those two classrooms that were displaced, which is for the kindergarten, are then uh, remodeled on the interior. And just to explain what the true issue is, is that right now the current That's the main concern at this building is, is the security. Okay. All right, the second, um, and this is just a detailed view here. Option two addresses the same need of security, but instead of renovating and taking a classroom, it's adding on to the front of the building. So it's a net gain in area. And it's also <coughs> allowing for better visibility for um, the reception. Hill. Um, meet the same needs, but two different approaches. One adds on to the front, gets better supervision, has a little more of an, uh, an identity because there's kind of something new there. The other one re renovates on the in interior and um, moves the kindergarten rooms to the center of the building. So tonight we're not asking the board in any way that you have to choose which option, you know, one or two, or <laughs> but it's just to show that there are options. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then the third priority project um, really stemmed from creating something that everybody in the district could have access to, to create that equity across the district. And at Parker, 
there's a concern there um, in the cafeteria, um, again, with safety uh, between uh, the cafeteria and the servery. The servery is too small. So this solves that, that problem, as well as uh, what Dr. Smith had talked about before, that each of the schools don't have adequately sized kitchens. They really don't have kitchens. And so this option here creates a central kitchen from which the food can be distributed to, um, to each of the satellite um, schools. So this is a, a proposal for the cafetorium addition at Parker Junior High. So it's providing um, a performance space, um, drama, music, centralized kitchen, a new servery, which addresses the issue um, for serving the kids' health and well-being, and also provides for flexibility uh, for physical education and a new lunchroom. Okay. And again, a, a back, back to what Fran had said is that uh, the, the, fe the funding is, pe is pending. Obviously, you, there's more here than you have current funding for, but these are the criteria and this, the priority <coughs> projects that the committee is recommending. So here you just see a little more detail. Um, the stage, the, the proscenium space, uh, the cafe cafeteria, which has a capacity of 360, uh, which is adequate for the needs of the junior high. And also you can see the, the central um, kitchen and uh, loading for um, dry storage, refrigerator. And then the existing space becomes a flex room. Um, the existing servery is, is reused there to augment the, uh, the music and, um, and orchestra um, uh, functions. Okay. All right, and then the, the fourth uh, priority projects are classroom upgrades. And there you can see the cost, two to three million Classroom upgrades are about modernization. So when you think about every single classroom, is it all have the same furniture? Does it all have the same lighting, um, the same technology? And so this is an initial uh, number here to, to, to seek to do that, to make all classrooms equitable in, in, in how they are delivering education from a, from a facility point of view. Um, and what I should point out is that in that 10-year facility plan, within that are already improvements to the interior finishes, to the lighting, which goes towards fulfilling this classroom upgrade, classroom modernization. So this is where kind of the two dovetail together. Okay, so these are the four, um, and then there's a couple of variations in there. But essentially, just to summarize, I mean, Western Avenue, ranges between three and five million. Heather Hill between one and a half and two. The Jun Parker Junior High Cafetorium, seven to eight. And the classroom upgrades uh, throughout the district from two to three. Just to be clear, the classroom upgrades are for all, all of the schools. Yeah, there's Thank a dollar you. amount per, per, um, per classroom, correct? Per classroom, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> And these projects really, again, they s summarize what the committee has worked on and they constitute what the recommendation is of these four projects. And really, are, we're here to get feedback from, from the board. Okay. So part of the process with the committee, if you go to the next slide, is to make sure we have consensus that everyone on the committee um, agrees or has a voice in the process. And so the initial vote really just confirmed that these four projects are, are still top priorities. Nice. Um, I mean, Parker, Heather, and Western obviously kind of floated to the top, but uh, you see in the next slide, we came back a second time at the last meeting, <coughs> and the votes were a little bit different. But it still validates that these are, the, these are still the top, five, top four priority projects. Okay. Even though classroom upgrades got zero volts on the second time, you're yeah. I think nothing in the, else the, got the number. The second meeting, there weren't as many people. Okay. But I think generally, if you go back to the previous slide, okay. I mean, it did have the lowest points originally. Um, okay. It, it has, I think if I could give context yeah, to that, I think why that may have gotten zero votes is because just as he said, it was already something that is going to be addressed 
so it's not like it needed to be its own project, if that makes sense. Because there's already monies that could be pulled, right, from other places to... In the facilities plan. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so then it... So it's, there's overlap there. Okay, okay. That's helpful. I just remember you saying storage, and I was I, I wondered if storage in, was included there when you talked about teachers needing nope. storage. Okay. Not right. in this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this summarizes the, the work to date. I mean, there's clearly a lot of detail that went into this meeting minutes and presentations and um, documents that can support all this, but really we wanted to bring this forward as a summary, as a kind of encapsulate, because uh, you know there's so many different projects that you could do, but these are the top ones that the committee is recommending. And it also meets these design criteria of the community identity, safety, classroom modernization, and programmatic offerings. Again, those were the four criteria, you know, the big headings criteria that that were in the were in the presentation earlier. So tonight, based on what you've heard, what are your initial thoughts on the projects? And what information will you need to make a decision to prioritize the projects? I'd say these are guiding questions. Yeah, we don't have to go questions. one by one, but certainly if you have thoughts on these questions, other things that came up, other pieces that you're thinking about, we'll take all of those. Will you remind us how the Long Range Planning Committee was formed and who was included and what representation mm -hmm. there was? Yeah, so we, we had parents, staff members, administrators. Uh, we have a committee member here tonight, so thanks for coming. Um, obviously, Wold and who else? Principals. Yeah, we have building principals, as I mentioned, classroom teachers, parents, And it seems I remember last... Uh, Non-student community members. Okay. And at some point, you talked to students, I remember, or at least principals talked to students? That was on the playgrounds, on the oh, playground playgrounds. piece. Okay. Okay. Yep. And you had two... These were the results of the voting that took place at two particular meetings. Correct. correct? The last two. Okay. Just yeah, the the second meeting, well, the first, the first of the last, they the group had said, can you come back with more information mm -hmm. okay. um, to help us, you know, keep the prioritization process going forward. So that's when we came back with the renderings and okay. a little more description yeah. on the site conditions. Um, and when people saw the new information, they some of them changed their minds. Okay. Yeah. But based on the votes, you feel like these four are aligned to our priorities. There's a good alignment, right? I think so. I mean, okay. you know, so our last question here is, you know, are there other projects that we may want to consider? You know, we have, we've had some conversations about a pre-K center and what that could look like. Now, yeah. again, that's partner dependent on another municipality. So yeah. I'm not sure how much thought and time we want to put into that, but I want to make sure that we, we at least consider all those different pieces that are sitting out there. Yeah. And when we think about, I think, the projects that we have, um, especially in, in the context of the last week and a half, making sure that those offices are secure, making sure that um, we do have a way to really kind of control the entrance and exit of people from our schools. Does There's just a different light that's kind of shown on that. And so I think between the projects that we have here, I mean, I think there are probably a few others that we may want to consider. You know, we did have the uh, Western Avenue arrival and dismissal on there, the pre-K piece, you know, and, and if there's something that we wanted to do at this building could be another one. But for the most part, I think the priorities that we've <coughs> talked about on the, in those projects kind of represent just the big rocks and challenges that we're facing right now. So as we look at the considerations at this point relative to our priorities, and this being high level, can't, is there access to a summary that kind of give us some of the details in terms of the expectations of what we should benefit from each of the individual projects so that as we consider this, we can have a little bit more depth in terms of what we're considering. And, and in terms of the makeup of the committee, was there any particular entity that pressed for a more forward-looking view of schools 
and how things are changing relative to in the context of the past week and a half, in the context of instructional practices. Um, there are a variety of things that are rapidly changing in the world of education and to what extent that we consider that in laying out our priorities. Along those lines, how many more meetings are you planning on gathering that? How many more times are you gathering that same group? One moment. Okay. I feel like you covered that there in that meeting, like exactly what Yeah, we said. may we may need to come back. Oh, and one okay. of the things that we did talk about. But no, what he was talking, what he said, I feel like I could even kind of answer one of those because we we discussed how are we going to be able to measure. Oh yeah. Right. And I think yep. that's where he's going. Uh, actually, Mr. Darguzzi, that's, 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 that's a dimension of it, certainly. Yes. So, part part of the question, and where we, I don't know that we adequately answered it, mm -mm. but so the question. And I, I would, Mr. Lanier, if you have comments, I, I would love you if you could add some context to it. No, no, I'm asking, really, I'd love to hear your context. Because the question that Mr. Gardu, Darguzas asked was, for example, if we renovate the Western Avenue office, how will that increase student achievement? I don't know that there's a way to say that safely getting kids and parents into school is going to directly in, in, increase student achievement. And so I think that's where, when you, if I'm hearing you correctly, when you ask about the kind of consequences of each of these options and what those outcomes could be, we can lay out those different. Yeah, you know. not not all of them are going to be direct links to student outcomes. There's functionality within the building. Or safety, right? Uh, uh, safety is important. Uh, we're in a very, like I said, a rapidly changing environment. There are so many things that will impact our decisions about schools that are constantly changing and we need to be very forward looking in the projects that we consider because things are changing so rapidly from classroom design from building design building layout restrooms how you design your restrooms there's so many things that are changing very rapidly in today's environment that we have to be very thoughtful in terms of making these decisions so any additional information that we can add to what's been pre positioned so that we have a better understanding would be extremely beneficial what i would say is this um first i want to give credit to the members of the committee um there was a lot that uh the committee poured into its process um, they provided a lot of um, really great ideas, perspectives um, to try to, to keep the, uh, the committee on task. Um, and I really applaud um, all that they've done um, and their willingness and their insights. Um, great job. Um, that speaks more to the process. To your question, um, there were several times that members of the committee um, um, asked, you know, more about what what is the the, the long range planning um, perspective in terms of objective outlines and and, and framework. Um, the the question was received and was, I don't think was ever really flushed out. Um, and um, I don't think that that. Um, all aspects of this process um, still have been flushed out um, because I think that that in in taking on this massive project, um, what everybody realized is that this is huge, and so um, that is just one part of it. Um, and so I don't think that it was not given credence or importance. It just was it something that fell into the bailiwick of what occurred with this, with this, um, with this initial um, um, effort? But I think it's definitely something that we, and we, we've actually received some some um, some comments about it um, that um, that can be presented or not presented. Um, I also think that um, the the long range planning could go further. Um, in aligning with the design criteria that's listed. Um, that was actually, can you, can you go back to that design criteria? Um, the design criteria is actually a, a good starting point. Um, yeah, like, yeah, all 
those are great starting points because when the committee did pull that together with the administration, it did so in an effort to, to put the children first, mm -hmm. to put the community first, um, and to be consistent with the strategic plan. That is a great framework from which to start. Um, I would say that as the process then continued um, and, and Wold was, was attempting to try to figure out how to prioritize what was undertaken, um, they tried to stay within this framework as much as possible, but I think that's where your question comes back up as to, to well, what, you know, what were we kind of looking at in terms of what that long range plan looks like. Um, but I think that that's great. Um, I think that um, what it did do, what, what we are really should try to do, again, to your question, is try to identify um, the problem um, as a board um, and as a community, to try to come up with a solution as a board and as a community, and to, to find out um, do we have, to, to Fran's point, funding as a board and, and as a community to, to do some of these things, and then what are the benefits? One of the things that the uh, committee was, was wrestling with was, okay, if we do this, what is the direct benefit for children? If we do this, um, does that alter or change um, um, academics? If we do this, what does that do in terms of um, um, any reflection on staff or the building? So that was, uh, that was an ongoing wrestle um, that I don't know where we finally landed on, but it, it, it was um, an, an ongoing discussion. Um, and I'm almost doing my point. The, the thing that I, I walked away with, and I've, I've kind of spoken to this before, was that we're being presented as if this is a 10-year a um, thing. I, I definitely think that this plan lays the foundation for something that goes well beyond 10 years. It can go 30 years or 50 years because a lot of the things that the committee looked at were, were the needs of each of the buildings. And, that the, and in my opinion, there needs to be some type of equity in, in terms of how we're going to look at it. So the fact that someone decided that there were only four projects to present, to me, does not encapsulate all the needs of all the buildings. And, and, and that, though, could become a very detailed and um, um, huge, again, thing to kind of look at, which is, I think, is why they have to plan the committee to talk. Um, some of those things to me, and I'm just going to highlight just a few of them, I think that um, the thing that stood out to the committee was that Parker's current cafeteria, gymnasium usage just needed to be addressed. And that's how that kind of came out. But there was a long list of other things that, that Parker also needed. Security was a huge thing, which is why the, the Heather Hill issue popped out. Um, and again, in light of what's occurred, again, to your point, recently, that was again um, highlighted. But some of the things that are universally needed to be addressed, in my opinion, that the committee, also, I think, also identified was um, our music programs, our gymnasium, um, our restrooms, our classroom uh, modernization, our uh, technology, which has kind of been presented. And then the fourth thing that, that, again, I'm hoping gets somewhere presented down the road, but we kind of talked about it in terms of pre-K, is the, the early childhood program. Um, which again was discussed in, in, as a priority, but again, it, it just, not that it fell off, but I don't know where it's at. Um, so what, what I think in, cl in closing to, to answer is that um, we need to hear more about how the process goes to the next steps, whether the committee meets again, reformulates, whether we formulate a committee uh, that the board actually uh, is participating in, that can look at all the issues and then look at all the prioritizations. But this to me is, is a great, great start. Um, I love some of the, the questions that have been posed at the end slide. You can go to that end slide. Um, and I would seriously say that, you know, that each of these types of questions needs to be talked about. However, we could be here for days just going through some of these. Um, because when Fran talked about the amount of money that we have Yes, that's the amount of money we have for the 10-year cycle, but as we start looking at what we as a board think is best for this community, what's best for these children, 
you know, we may step outside of the four projects that, that someone came up with and say we want to look at some, some others. So one of the things that um, was requested was a possible executive summary, which would have highlighted some of the things I'm talking about um, and at least given the board, you know, it's a, sort of a, a deeper breath as to what some of the needs are. Um, and with that, I'll close. Would you like to respond? Or Do, can you, can you clear, oh, go ahead. I have a question though. Go, I just want to clarify because I heard David say someone. I was under the impression that what I'm seeing on slide 32 and slide 33 are votes based on the committee. It's not some, we're not wondering who, right? I, I'd like to speak to, oh, okay. I'm, was kind of dumbfounded about the someone, but I'll start with my vantage point because I also was a representative of the Board of Education in that committee. Um, with that, uh, I saw a group of amazing individuals from our community and our buildings come together and sh you know really dive into what improvements need to be made in all of our buildings. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a tree out here back uh, with loads of money that, you know, an infinite supply. So what um, the, the group did was go through and truly highlight all the things, our wish list, right? Like if you had an endless supply, what would you do? With that endless supply, we looked with a fine tooth comb of what needs to be done to one, keep our students safe. Above all, before anybody can be educated, they must be safe. And what came to the top were, as we saw, the two options, which were Heather Hill, I think was almost, in my opinion, Heather Hill came above Western's entrance. But um, either way, they came to the two. One, because of Heather Hill's um, entrance uh, was just completely unsafe to Western Avenue's entrance was too small. There was just, it, it was a, a, an issue that needed to be addressed. Um, as David alluded to, we also talked about renovations for classrooms. That was huge. All buildings need a refresh. A lot of it, like Fran has said, our buildings are old. They need refreshers, but a lot of money goes into what we don't see, the not sexy things. Um, so. That was the one thing. And then also, we all know Parker needs more space. There's just kids, needs more space. We need to look forward uh, for um, uh, food prepping so we can shuttle that out to the other buildings. There's just, that's, those were the four areas of the grander scheme that we narrowed into based on the amount of funding that we have available here and what Fran has come with. I, I think this is an amazing plan for a 10-year plan. I think if we wanted to go out, sure, we could say, we're going to knock down this building, we're gonna renovate this building, and it's gonna be a pre-K center. We, could, we can dream and dream and dream for all of the things, but for prioritization of safety and how to flow our buildings, these four projects were highest level <coughs> in the entire committee. No, someone decided these on their own. Dr. Smith didn't go home and say, yeah, these are the ones, because in fact, he and I differed on many things of where we wanted prioritization. Um, but the entire committee came together and we formulated together, and you can see prioritization even on two different votes, still prioritization was in those two entrances, bottom line, hands down. Um, didn't mean we don't want more band space at Parker. Doesn't mean we don't want uh, better um, art facilities, you know, in the elementary buildings. It doesn't mean that we don't. It just means that we were put together for a long range plan for the greater good of those big projects that we need to do with a limited amount of funding at this juncture. And in fact, I'm sorry to be standing on a soapbox because that's not me. Um, the cafetorium was added after the fact because there was such a need by the committee to even have an option for that somehow if there was funding available. So we heard the needs of the committee and we actually agreed that that should be added. So my question, so that, that's my vantage point. Um, we did a great job working together. I think 
Uh, there's a lot that I, I want to see, you know, uh, but it, I know that our funding is not available for everything within the next five to 10 years. It just isn't. Uh, Fran addressed it. Um, we can all address that cost of everything is going up and it probably isn't going to come down re just respectively over the next five years. It just isn't, maybe ever. Uh, with that, the questions that I would like to see answered, um, so I did a little jot down. If I chose my options, I just back the envelope, as Dana likes to say, whatever, my numbers. Um, where I have a hard time um, separating is uh, I know that we have a lot of projects um, qualified under life safety, and I'm not sure if you can even do this. Uh, so, like, I know, Fran, I need 13 mil. Like, give me 13 mil. How do we get 13 mil to get this done, right? So, but, oh, but Christina, this, uh, this project is in that, but it's covered here. I don't know how, it, don't if, if there's a way to separate that mm -hmm. to see, um, because, if I chose, you know, option one and two for Heather Hill, that's like five-ish million dollars. And look, that's uh, the fund balances. We have five to six. Perfect. We can pay for those. Can we you know, squeak out eight mil for Parker two? You know, those things. Like, I guess that would be like, mm -hmm. Fran, where can you get money <laughs> from? Does that? Yeah. Well, and that's yes. So. And that's see, and that that's amazing. So I just keep thinking of what Michael <coughs> said about um, how can we quantitate or qu quantitatively measure all the things that we're doing here. And um, I think these projects, and this is my humble opinion, these two that are at the top. The only way you're going to quantitatively measure anything with these is that our kids are we're going to have safety. I think. These are just safety. No one, are they going to be able to learn better if they're safe? Well, absolutely. So, yes, but this is literally a safety issue across the board and not for that, safety first. Everything else comes secondary. So, I don't know, Michael, if that answers your question. It, it goes That's a long way, and you actually demonstrate one of my concerns. As a board, we're in a position where we need to make some very significant and important decisions, and in order to make adequate and appropriate decisions, we need good information. And since we were not directly a part, and I'm saying those who weren't a part of the committee, we do need that insight. We do need that experience that you had, Christina, understanding what was driving those priorities and why you went in the direction you went into. So if there's a document, a presentation, whatever, that gives us more of a rationale for the various choices, what considered why we prioritize this, that would be beneficial, at least for me, in terms of being prepared to make a decision about something that's going to have long-ranging effects for our school district. So not that there's any second guessing uh, the work that was done. The time and energy spent is greatly appreciated. However, to make solid decisions, you need solid information, and that's what I'm looking for. What are the expectations we have for these priorities? How will we know if these, these priorities lived up to our expectations? And did we have that forward-looking perspective, which again, I can't emphasize enough how crucial that is in education. There are things that are issues in 2022 that weren't very big issues in 2018 or in 2015. And just like there's issues now, we have to try to anticipate and consider issues that will come up in 2026 or 2027. So we, we just need the best possible information as a board to make those decisions. And a lot of that information probably was discussed within the committee. We need some type of summary of that. That's all. You know, to, to, to again, to, uh, to that point, I completely agree that the committee definitely saw the, the need to address safety. That stood out right off the bat. 
the committee also saw the need to address the, the Parker situation um, in terms of the, the, the cafeteria, the, the cafetorium, and all of that. And again, what I, what I really want to emphasize is that, you know, we, we also need to, to find out what the community thinks about it um, and, and get their involvement in, in, this, in this, this process also. The second major point is that one of the things that we, we've kind of done, which is why I go back to, to maybe we stop looking at it as just a 10-year um, plan, is we, we, we have now kind of fixed ourselves in a box where we say, okay, we have X amount of dollars to try to go ahead and do these projects. And so we force ourselves into looking at just um, this finite uh, situation based upon money. Whereas what we, what we should possibly do is expand that to say, okay, well, what are the priorities? And then let's look at, you know, if, if we don't have that money now, then maybe we have it in 20 years. And we start to prioritize that, whether it's with the facility plan, the life safety plan, all of those types of things. And that's where it's, it becomes a much more uh, complex um, a plan, but it's a much more thorough plan. It's a plan that not only you know, this board can deal with, but it's a plan that future boards can deal with. And it's a plan that also hopefully do uh, dovetails and ties into other efforts that are being maybe taken on at the high school level, et cetera. So those are the types of things that I also w would want this board to consider. I, I agree with that. I do, I do see the need for a vision. I do. Um, but just as Fran said, she doesn't like to bond out more than 10 years. I don't think it um, makes sense for us to be making decisions or even putting um, expiration dates on projects for a board that, frankly, I won't be on, she won't be on, and, and things of that nature. We can have a list of these are the budget or these are the line items that we would like to see um, in, the, in the district and done the projects that we'd like to see. Um, but I don't know that that's something that can be concretely um, agreed upon or voted on, you know, by us. But did you start with a dollar amount, or did you start with these identified criteria? Like, did you say we have to live underneath a threshold, or did you start with? We, we didn't. But okay. I, I just I, I want to bring back some of the context. So the the board was very thoughtful when they designed the the committee. Community members, staff members. Uh, community members without children. And we had two board representatives, Christina Vlistra and David Lanier, specifically on the committee right. to represent the issues, the interests of the board and to be able to share effectively when we came to this setting. In addition, David Lanier also sits on the finance committee because we, we want to make sure as we we're talking about the planning that we also yeah. have the money ready. Right. If everyone goes back to when we originally started this process, no one was willing to go to the community for a referendum, right? And so if we're not willing to go to the community to ask for $100 million or, or some very large dollar amount, we do have to live within what those financial realities are. Right. A gym is about 12, 10 to $12 million, okay? We, we need gyms at all of our elementary schools except Heather Hill, okay? We know that right off the bat. I don't know that it's, it, it would have been feasible for us to say, we know that we need gyms, that's $36 million. We also don't know how we're going to pay for it. And we haven't really talked about any of the real priority issues that exist. Because as you walk around Parker, as David said, we don't have a space for the band to practice. They share with uh, uh, the chorus and the cafeteria is an issue and, and all those different pieces. We real, realistically could identify $75 million worth of work within 10 minutes. But the actual reality is, as we're looking at what's going to impact and the climate of the district, and by climate I mean the experiences of the kids, um, the feelings of safety, access to programs, et cetera, the group identified those priorities. And so um, we did work very collaboratively together, a lot of communication, and it's always tough when you have a committee and 30% of the committee changes from meeting to meeting, yeah. right? And so I thought, I thought that the participants did a really good job of kind of carrying that context forward. And I have those questions captured because we want to bring some more of that context to the board so you can kind of see that path that we walked to, to, to get to this point. But I think the value in looking at not only the finances, but the design criteria at the initial start of the project is that then you don't get out over your skis. 
because if we came back and we had an $85 million price tag and there wasn't an appetite to go um, campaign for a referendum in the community and potentially look to our taxpayers for a tax increase, we know that that's going to limit what we can do. If that has changed here, then we, I think we could have that conversation and then come back with different options and then we can talk about what that looks like. But if we're going to live within the current financial realities that we do have, without seeking additional funding, we're limited on the projects that we can recommend and in not wanting to waste anybody's time, we didn't want to get too outlandish sure. on the nice to haves versus the what do we really needs to kind of keep our district moving forward. But again, we can change all of that. We were just kind of working with in the context of where this project started with the board. I want to add. I'm oh. sorry, just to kind of yeah. add to what uh, Dr. Smith said. It's not that we're looking for a change at all. Sure. We're just looking for the information oh, yeah. that have gotten us to this point. So as we consider a vote, we want to know what were the factors that got us here sure. to, so that we can make an informed decision. That's all. Absolutely. And, and to add to Michael, the, this would help me <clears throat> because I, I appreciate what Michael brought forward. If you could connect those pieces to the criteria. So for example, if space for community engagement af after our use bubbled up as a priority, then, the, then I can understand, oh, the cafetorium will, will, will supply more space for that. Correct. So if you could use some of the criteria in to your, to the yeah, yep. that would be helpful to me. Um, and like, I know you're talking about safety and physical safety, but also like health safety, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, as we move to wanting to have more physical, social distancing space between sure. people in spaces, if that also was a piece of that, that would be helpful to me too, at least with the Parker piece. Absolutely. Can you, well, know, can you repeat the last piece? Uh, sorry, David, one second. The, the last question, I'm sorry, I missed the second part of the last question. Well, connecting it to the criteria that you identified in the four, yep. in the design criteria piece, but then also if it's not just physical safety, but it's also thinking, because we're looking at what happened in the last couple of weeks, but I also, I'm assuming you also looked at what happened with the pandemic and how difficult it was to just gotcha. create okay. space yep. in our spaces. Sure. So I wonder if, that you thought about that with the cafetorium too, because it creates space for music, but it also creates literal physical space so people are not on top of each other. I wondered if that was also absolutely part of there was there, there was a couple of, uh, of points that that um, I also want the board to to consider, um, and it was touched upon, but I really would hope that we can highlight it when when, when this comes back, and that's um, and it was a question that the committee asked, um, but we couldn't get an answer to because it would take a lot of digging. Um, but if we do a capitorium, um, we would actually potentially be able to, to have it serve as a, um, a food preparation. So the benefit of that would be that we would actually be able to prepare meals ourselves for the four elementary schools. The question that was asked by the committee is, is there a way, and this is where it gets very detailed, is there a way for us to figure out what the cost benefit savings would be to do something like that? Um, and those types of things, again, get back to the details about why we kind of got to where we got to. Um, and again, the, to summarize, and I, and I actually sort of prepared four pages of summary of just all the stuff we looked at. Um, it's, a, it's very detailed, and, and I, um, I can appreciate that it, it, it would just take another, again, undertaking, but I think it would actually just really benefit everybody if, if they could see some of that um, backdrop. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Well, good. We have um, definitely some you know, uh, takeaways here to come back with um, additional detail, benefits, background information, um, linking the uh, solutions to the design criteria. Uh, so we will definitely uh, provide that and compile it so you can, again, to help you make those decisions. I know, for yeah. me, one of the things that I really would also like to see is um, some more detail about um, modernization because I'm, I really think that we should look at the equity component of trying to do something for all the schools 
and even though the, the voting illustrated that it was not a top priority, it made the list of priorities because that ties into our STEAM and STEM labs, it ties into modernization for our libraries, it ties into digitalization, it ties into having a, a, a lighter environment, it ties into actually giving children a better space in which they can grow. And, and, and some of that, I think, would help the board to recognize, again, not necessarily, you know, just what we did, but if we do go, you know, out further than the 10 years, we can say, okay, well, fine, maybe that becomes another thing we do in, in um, 20 years, where we actually are trying to do those things. So for me, that would also be helpful, to that, the modernization piece. But won't they, in 20 years, isn't that stuff already outdated? I, I actually would like to see it done sooner. But the, again, for, for me, I, and I, I get the, the, the trick, is do we say, okay, well, we have X amount of dollars to do just these one, these one things, mm -hmm. But you have to also be realistic to say that, that the prioritization might be that it takes us beyond those amount of dollars because it's actually going to benefit your children. That's kind of what I'm talking about. So if we have some of that information, so the, again, the board can look at that as a collective to see what those five items are. I, I, I have a couple comments I'd like to yeah. make if, if it's a good time. Absolutely. Okay. So I'll try to keep it short because I'm on the phone. and. Uh, and, and we've, a lot's been said already. Um, I think it is important in this process to keep a record of what was left on the cutting room floor, not just for the immediate process, but also for um, that future board 10 years from now that has to come and, and consider a new bond issue. Um, I hear your comments about leaving gyms on the cutting room floor because they're just too expensive and there wasn't any appetite to go to for referendum, Dana. But this board as a whole has to recognize that that will be a problem. Like, no one is ever going to solve that problem without a referendum. And we're just kicking the can down the road to a board that 10 years from now probably won't include any of us. And they're going to face the same question. So at the very least, we can try to move the ball forward and tell them, you know, this is why we didn't do it this time. We're confident we cleared the deck so that you guys have room to do it or something. Otherwise, I feel like we're just avoiding a tough issue. The second piece is that tough issue is that we have several buildings in the district that are just, and I, I have no, I'm sure there's a more diplomatic way to say this, but they're just old and weird, right? So all, they're not the way we would build schools if we built them today. And I'm not talking about just the fads or the short-term surges like steam labs, um, the bones of the building, right? Uh, Heather Hill is a good example. You know, that building is cobbled together piece by piece. There's interior, win there's exterior windows in the interior of the building. There's, it's weird. And we're addressing some of those problems, but I don't think the community is ever going to solve that problem without building a new school someday. Now, if there was ever even a chance of, of the community having the appetite for something like that, it went away in the last year in the view of the current economic situation, inflation, and everything else. At first, they had no interest in pursuing that in today's economic environment. But we also have to recognize that that problem isn't going to go away. If we spend $10 million every bond issue every 10 years, over the course of 100 years, this community will spend $100 million. If we keep going down this path of going down, we're just going to end up with, we're, we're still going to have a patched together building over Heather Hill. We're still going to have, uh, you know, a pit in the floor for a gym at Serena and, and all the other, you know, sort of weird quirks of buildings have. So we can avoid it for now, but we, we need, I don't think we're being good board members if we don't set up the next board that has to deal with this question for, a, for more success. On the, um, my other piece, so, so given that context, I don't have any problem. All these projects look great, but um, but they don't look that great to me because like our primary mission is to educate kids. And so the one thing in this whole slide deck that, ha that to me, I, I think, please let me know if I missed something, that would have the greatest impact would be pre-K. And pre-K, as I understand, it's a bit of a stretch goal on this. It's not really in the proposal. So to me, we didn't, 
me, the prioritization would be which is going to have an immediate impact on kids. I hear the safety piece. I frankly, I don't find it persuasive, but we can, I'll, I'll discuss that offline because we don't, I don't discuss the safety issues in public. But, um, you know, I've seen all these problems that are being addressed here, the office spaces and the door entrances and whatnot. I agree that they're problems. But what I, what I have trouble seeing is are they big, there are, there are other things we can find in the district that, that are also problems. Um, and so how do we pick one over the other? And to me, the, the tiebreaker should be this is going to substantially improve student performance or experience. Or as an exception, the situation is so bad, you know, teachers will revolt if we don't fix this. I think there's a teacher's lounger, too, that fits that criteria. Yeah. But um, it's not clearly prioritized to me. So when I look at slide uh, 30, where we have the upgrade options, the classroom upgrades, to me, are the ones that have the most impact on student experience and the keepers. And if we recognize that someday we're going to have to spend $36 million on gyms, maybe we should do very little right now, just food for thought. Um, so, you know, I, I see that, I understand, I think, why there's no Flossmoor Hills or Serena Hills structure here. Um, I think this board has a responsibility if we're going to decide to do nothing with the current bond issue for those two buildings, then we need to leave the next board, wherever that, whatever form it may take, a plan for what should happen at those buildings next. It, or at least an explanation of why we decided not to do anything. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why to, to carve, to make those two buildings handle them separately because they're architecturally essentially identical. But um, that said, I think that's part of our uh, mission that we need to set up future boards for success. All right, so that's all my initial comments. I made some more by email. But those are my thoughts on what we're seeing here today. Thanks, Cameron. Those are good points. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other pieces? I just have a question about the committee and the setup. So for the vote, is it for how it bubbled up, was it 15 people in a room or was it 50 people in a room? So. Could you vote for? You could vote for more. You could vote for two, for example. Okay. So then, for the grouping that was there, these are the ones that kind of bubbled up within the context of our parameters of the bond and that whole situation. Correct. Okay. And earlier in the process, there was other dot voting as well that laid out all of the different sort of identifiable <coughs> issues or criteria where the group was dot voting even amongst a lot more than just those four. And then from that, it kept going down, you know, to that final four there. And then we just said, well, of these, what would be your priorities? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of caught the snapshot right there at the end, but that throughout the whole process, we've always been reprioritizing dot voting um, to get to funnel it down to those projects and I think you know that list is available um, to you know we didn't put anything away we could certainly bring that forward as a full document yeah. um, so. was this presented to district leadership team no okay mm. I, I would say the only thing I'm, I'm still a little bit unclear on because I think we're, we're around it it's this idea between what we're going to do and how much money we're going to spend on it. Because I'm still hearing a very large gap that I don't see us closing. And so as we go back and we work on this, are, are we looking at the right criteria? Do we need to switch to only student achievement? I mean, I, I, I'm, any feedback that you can provide here would be helpful because really I'm hearing projects that are going to far outpace what we can pay for, and that's okay, because we know that we're going to carry those things forward. But I'm also hearing that the board, there are some board members who would rather focus on the classroom and not on things like offices and things like that. So well, I just, I need so any feedback that you can share here would be great. So I think part of what's missing is what Michael has asked for. So I suspect that 
principals, teachers, paraprofessionals, community members would have a say about the impact that the Heather Hill and Western Avenue office will have beyond safety. That's my guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know, though, that. And same thing with the cafetorium. I'm guessing from the people that walk these halls every day, they're going to tell you, oh, it's not just safety. It's these seven things, and this is what Michael was getting at. So I'm, I, can't, I can't say that the classroom upgrades deserve to be over some of the other things if I don't first understand beyond safety, are there other pieces that the Heather Hill main office change would have an impact? I, I, I'm guessing as I look at the list of criteria, those things were thought about beyond just as it's physically safe. Sure. The other thing is you mentioned that some of the pieces in the classroom upgrades that we want mm -hmm. To David's point, the modernization are already happening or are anticipated to happen. I don't know that either yet. So, mm -hmm. if if there are some pieces that are about to occur, then it's then we're doing it. We happen to be doing it alongside this. I would yep. need I need that too. So for me, I'm very comfortable with the process. I'm very comfortable with mm -hmm. the the how the votes turned out and the the role that the committee played. I'm very comfortable with that. Yeah. I just now need this part two. Absolutely. Sure. I don't, I, and again, only because I sat in the committee and had listened to that, the, the, the two to three million dollars for the classroom upgrades, if I'm not mistaken, that's more cosmetics. That's not like any real big heavy lifting. Um, like that's why I kind of get a list of, if we start to do things with technology, if we start to do things with the libraries, if we start to do things um, with lighting, with, and, and the phrases used now, flexible classroom designs. If we start to do those type of things, then again, to his point, now the, that number, you can put up a zero behind it. Sure. Um, so, sure. again, but I appreciate his question because his question is an appropriate question. It's a tough question. What's the board want to do? How much do you want to spend? And what, and what's, what takes precedence? Yeah. Is the, the money or the, the things that are needed for the children and event? It's a tough question. And I love it because it is a tough question, but we need to really kind of, I don't know if we're going to get there tonight. No, yeah, so, to an, so for me, I'm comfortable with the process that we've engaged in for now with what's in our wallet. But, I, but what Cameron brought up and what you're bringing up is, but what else? And what does it look like for year 11 to year 21 or to year 20? And I think that's valuable too. It just happens to not be what we set out to do. So if we need to set out and do another round two of this, yeah. I think we should. And, and I think we should find out whatever else is on the, the cutting floor, what didn't make it. I agree with Cameron and David. We need to be able to say, here's where we are based on the process that we began and what we wanted to do. And here's what phase two would look like. That's for me. Yeah. Th this is excellent. I mean, this is exactly what we needed out of this conversation, frankly. Mike, do you have other pieces that you need from the board? Uh, no, I think that in concerning the classroom modernization, I mean, there's certainly a spectrum of things you can do, um, whether it's just, you know, furniture, paint, lighting. Um, you can get into the curricular needs with storage um, and technology. And that can be menued out. You know, yeah. so you get different tiers of expenses, and we can, you know, mm -hmm. work with that. But I think adding detail could help in that case. It sounds like it. it that would be helpful in that in that capacity because yeah. yeah. the question about how does it overlap, how does it dovetail yes. with, the, with the tenure? Yes, I think that would help. Um, because it is the bathrooms. The bathrooms. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The bathrooms. Right. Some of the bathrooms are addressed in the tenure, so that can also be brought forward. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I think that detail would help. Um, you to, to develop this roadmap, you know, so you understand the big picture as well as the detail, which I think we still, you know, happy to bring that back. Yeah. One last. Oh, but, you want to go? okay. But I just so part of the reasons I asked about the the voting for what we have, to Carolyn's point, for what we have and what we're doing. This is what we're focusing on, or are we now focusing on all the other stuff? That's my own personal question to my 
board members. It sounds like there is other stuff already that is numbers five, six, seven to 27 or however many. And but so, before we can make a decision, we no. need to hear all the other I things don't. or, okay, because like for me, that's, that was part of my questioning as to for the sample population that was in the room, a decision was made and then we can go forward with something and then all this other stuff just becomes an additive forward thinking, that kind of thing. Well, but if that's not what we're saying, then I am okay saying that, too. but I think we need a formalized part two. Once this gets moving and we get the additional information that we need, to Michael's point, to be able to say, yes, I agree 100%, or mm, I need you to look at this again, once we finish that, then I think we need to say, here's the next, what the next 20 years needs to look like, based on the, big, the work that they've started. And so that's what we're asking the committee to go back and do. First, we need more information. Mm -hmm. I don't think okay. we have enough information okay. as a board to be able to say, yeah, I, this, I get this and I understand why. I don't know what, we're gonna, what, what information you'll and give us. Let me give you a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. if, uh, to kind of go back to the difficulty of the box. So let's say we as a board, we work from the four items that are on the board. And the board agrees to do the capitorium and to do heaven. Okay, but then that, eight plus two is, is 10. And we still have um, whatever's left. But then we say, you know what, we, we want to now go ahead and look at the classroom upgrades. So maybe we now say, okay, well we don't do Western, but we do classroom upgrades. So now we can go ahead and play that number and move it. So it, it gets into... So wait, so I get the math. I'm saying the recommendation from the long range planning committee is Consider these four. I'm keeping it very simple. Yeah. Yes. So now, in this moment, we're saying that we are not taking the recommendation of the Long Range okay. Planning oh. Committee, and we want to kick it back for that committee to do more things. No, I don't. We're not saying that. We're saying we need more information from the committee about. Those okay. Right. Things. So we're we're ask, Well, we're asking the committee to. We need to flesh out some of this so that we have a better understanding, so we're more informed. And if indeed we can't do four and we have to identify three, the additional information will help us. Okay. Then, after all of that, we're saying, what was left over? What are the other things that you really wanted? Because we want to also think about the 10 years beyond this. And that's what I'm going to get at. Exactly. That's but I, but that's yeah. not, that was not the initial purpose of this. We never set right. out to say, Long Range Planning Committee, we need to know what 40 years looks like here. We never said that. Right. But now we're kind of saying, once we come up with this 10-year plan, we also want to know what the next 20 years looks like. And I think the importance of that is, whatever decision is made is going to be foundational for what decisions are made thereafter. Correct. Yeah. So we, we have to do an adequate job of, of considering them. In fact, you, know, you, make, you may make fund balance decisions. Yeah. Right? We're going to be more conservative so we can build up that fund balance because we are looking at a project in 27. I'm gonna repeat though, and not to be a broken record, we don't have the money to do all four of these projects. Right. And so as we do kind of get into the weeds on furniture and labs and all those different things, these sliding bars will have to go up and down based on what we're trying to accomplish. And that, that's why, I, bless you, that's why I asked a question about yeah. just are we focused on the right pieces? Uh, so what we'll, what we'll do is we'll come back We'll pull out the, the general questions and try to group them by area. Uh, but then in addition, we'll add the, uh, essentially what I heard from a number of people, this context and impact around each of these different choices, what they mean, and then what those next steps could be, either for gathering additional information, if there's cost information that we can get from, from the architects, et cetera, we can bring that. Um, yeah. The bond, you know, the bond mm -hmm. impacts as well, because as those interest rates go up, not good for us. But we will bring this back essentially every meeting until yeah. we good. feel good. Fran's right. Yeah. We do want to be on, on a solid foundation by October. So if everyone feels good by then, you know, at least if we can give the go ahead, yes, we're going to move forward with part of the bond sale now. But then we at least know at that point, here's the direction. We've, we've gone through the context and all those different pieces. We at least feel pretty good about 
that first step of the process, and we can start from there. Fran, do you need anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Thanks. I'll call you this week. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is IT security infrastructure upgrade. Oh, yeah. oh I got kicked out one second. Well, Leonard can talk us through it. Yeah, I'm good over here. Is that, did I get, did I skip? No, that's right, that's the next thing. Good evening. Hello. Um, okay, so what this is, is basically a proposal to upgrade and enhance our cybersecurity environment. Um, I'm sure as you all know, we're in a day and time where um, cyberspace is very, um, it's very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's, a, it's a big deal, there's a lot going on. Um, it takes a lot to uh, protect and ensure that we, um, that our district is covered, that we are well protected, that our data is secure, um, and that's for staff, students. Um, and so what we have here is essentially um, a three-layer a three proposal that gives us the support, the protection, and basically a 24-7 overwatch um, of all of our district data, um, both back end network and our take home devices. And so the project is a three, it's a three tier project. There's the, uh, the EDR, which is endpoint detection and response, which is specifically for our endpoint devices. So for the devices that we use in district that we take home, it gives us uh, a layer of protection that not only works in district, but it actually um, gives us similar support out of district as well. So it focuses uh, specifically on the devices itself. Uh, we have our security incident and event management tier, which is, gives our district a constant overwatch of what our incoming traffic is. Hey, um, there's, uh, there's traffic incoming 11 o'clock every Thursday night that seems be malware. Let's detect that. Let's shut it down. Let's let's keep it out, and we'll use pockets of cyber intelligence to tell us going forward that you know whenever we see these types of traffic, we're going to keep them out. We're going to uh, keep them from entering our network. And so that's pretty much the overview of of uh, security incident event management. And then there's also what I I deem very important: uh, disaster recovery. Uh, say, for instance, uh, God forbid we are ever hit with ransomware or some sort of um, terrible or something major, we're hit with a crisis. Uh, disaster recovery uh, gives us the ability to restore our network, to uh, get our district um, up and running, regardless of whether or not it's ransomware, anything. Disaster recovery takes snapshots of our network. And so in the event that we're taken down, we're able to say, hey, well, we'll keep things up and running. We're able to restore um, our uh, district equipment. We're able to restore our network and basically um, we're able to keep operations going. And so the proposal is for this, um, this three-tier solution, which also directly um, complies with our cyber insurance, um, so it also fulfills the requirements um, that we need as a district um, um, in order to maintain that as well. Um, headed by um, Net56, um, a, a, team of, of, um, a team of professionals um, that'll work with me and my staff, uh, gives us the resources, the knowledge, the intelligence, um, helps us with the software, the implementation, the hardware provides pretty much everything we need to make sure this is, hot, this is hard, solid, um, and gives us the assurance 
that we will um, put our district in a, in a good place going forward. Uh, basically, a breakdown of the costs of the software licensing comes out to roughly around 18 grand. Um, and then to monitor this is almost about three grand a month. Um, and so we'll, we'll be looking at a total of a little over 50 grand. Um, and I'll tell you, um, shopping around um, other vendors, looking at what other districts are doing, uh, these prices are very competitive. Um, I think given the nature um, of what we are encountering today and given how important and how significant this is, I really feel like this puts us in a good position. I feel like the, the prices are, are very competitive um, and I, I certainly recommend um, what we've put forth. Bernard, a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, one, will the company provide 24 seven um, access and customer service to the district? Absolutely, okay. yes. Second, second question. Um, having now watched what children are doing and how many children are on the computers Uh, does this try to help bring some of that in because they are out of control? You're right. So I think, I think you're talking more of like a content filtering and management piece. And we have other things in place for that. This, so while kids are browsing all over the place and they're, you know, let, let's, you know, let's keep it real. While they're finding, you know, ways to continue to, you know, break through and filter through different content pieces, this is going to assure that out of all of those pockets of internet browsing that they're doing and it's hitting our district, this just further ensures that with all of that cyber world of unknown that's out there, this assures that we'll, we'll stay protected. So that, that site that's got, um, that's got a browser attached that, that might make it past our first level firewall here, uh, this package still ensures that there will be nothing, um, no cyber traffic that enters in and puts us at risk. Because some, some so. of these kids are smart. They are <laughs> finding ways oh, to get out. Absolutely. And so I'm, I'm asking. This is primarily on the insurance side. You're looking at more content based. We can bring that back for a separate conversation. But this really kind of came from um, us having to look at our insurance carriers and know that we have to make some guarantees, especially on the endpoint management. Uh, we believe that uh, the second piece, oh shoot, where'd it go? The, uh, if you mind scrolling up, it was the- Security and the security yeah, incident, yeah, the security and incident management. management. We believe that that's going to come next as a, a mandatory piece on those insurance policy, so this really covers that, but we can bring content filtering back as well if, for a different conversation. Yeah. I'm definitely all in favor of this. I'm oh, all, sure. all in favor of all the security we can get because, again, not only are our children trying to get out, there are people trying to definitely get in, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm, but that's why I want to find out what is, yeah. whether this covers or not. You're saying it's not yeah. yet. Well, th no, no, this covers all of those pieces because, I mean, what this covers, if you think of uh, when you hear of Lincoln College that just had a ransomware attack and shut them down forever. Mm -hmm. This is in that vein. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about a kid finding a website to get through our filters so that they could look at something inappropriate, this doesn't cover that directly. This covers the fact that they went around the filter potentially onto another dangerous site and now that's going to introduce malware and that's where the protection comes from. So. There's two conversations that we have to have at the same time. It's you know, content filtering and what they're looking at, but also when they sneak around the filter and they figure out ways because they are very smart, are we protected on the back end? And that's what this does. Um, I, I happen 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, and I, I, I won't have to say get it. I've seen enough you know, Matrix movies. So <laughs> my point is I just want to make sure that we actually yeah. try to get it both ways. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and we'll, oh, and yeah. we'll bring it back. The content piece at another meeting, I think it's a great conversation to have. Is this in addition to what's existing? Is there anything that's existing that will fall off because we add this? Yeah, so this is, this is certainly in a, this is not only in addition to what's existing, uh, some of this is actually just a pure upgrade or just an enhancement of what's existing. I mean, we, we just have to, as, as we've seen the nature, like I said, of, of these attacks grow and become more severe, more complex, it just, it's essential that we, um, that we stay proactive and kind of and stay up to date with with our response, you know. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I Next item: physical restraint, timeout, and isolated timeout reduction plan. <laughs> Welcome, Jackie. So ISBE has updated the rules and regulations for um, timeout physical restraint. And to give you a little background on that, we only physically restrain a student if they are a threat to themselves or others. This year we've had two students that we've actually restrained and that's been four incidents. So it's a very low incidence in our district. We are in a great space for this. However, there are some rules and regulations that needed to be update, updated as um, amendment to the Public Act, which basically tells us that we have to make sure that we're notifying parents in a reasonable amount of time, and there are specific um, times to actually look at that. The other requirement that we had to do is have an oversight committee, and that oversight committee was to review our processes and update anything that is not up to date and also to work on a reduction plan, which we've already met the goal. And the state's goal is to, um, over a 12-month period, they want to see a 25% reduction in the use of restraints for students experiencing over five instances in a 30-day period. We're already there, so we're, again, in a good space. However, we still have to go through this process because eventually the state, I believe, will be saying that any public school system is not going to be allowed to put any hands on. So we need to be proactive in that. So if you can see up here, I met with a committee. We had teachers, social workers, um, paraprofessionals, and administrators also, and we looked at the different requirements that they were asking us to look at as far as putting this plan together. One of which is looking at what that cultural change would look like. So meaning, what are we doing to de-escalate students in regards to their behavior instead of putting hands on or restraining? So that leads to what I brought to the board last meeting is our verbal intervention or our de-escalation. That's our professional development goal, meaning that all staff will be trained in that part of de-escalation where you're verbally intervening first and kind of having those practices in their tool chest in order to use that if they are experiencing something in the classroom with a student. So that's our first professional development goal. And then if you kind of move down a little bit there. Also, we had to look at, oh, could you go up one more? Thank you. Just one, yeah. So the other part of it is looking at our procedures and making sure that that parent letter is district-wide using, everyone's using the same parent letter, and I think I included most of that in mm -hmm. um, to your backup material. And in that letter, making sure that the parents are notified that they have the right to request a meeting, that is something that I am positive that all of our principals met with, with parents if they did have to restrain a student, but now we're just putting those things in place. And also sharing the rights that they have to file a complaint. We also have to share that with parents so they know where to get that if they are in disagreement with that. And those are things that nobody really had in their processes since this, so now we will make sure that ours reflect that. And then also a process for debriefing. That is something that really came out 
of our oversight committee. That, that can be a very emotional time for teachers and social workers and administrators, and then just setting that time where you can kind of talk about the incident also. So that's something that came through the committee, um, not necessarily a requirement. And then, and then again, just documenting the process. Another part of that too is making sure that staff is aware of any type of um, any type of situation that a student may have experienced, any kind of trauma that they may have experienced. Now, we're not always going to know that, but in that debriefing, also that can be a time where you're making sure you're covering those things and that is being, the staff is aware of any other significant needs and things like that. So that's also part of the regulation. And then, really moving forward, just making sure that we have those meetings. I put here, as we talked, you know, making sure in the fall that we meet again, that we're reviewing um, the new, pro or not even new process, but just the updated process, making sure that social workers, principals, staff are all aware of what the process is. And then again, meeting in the spring, or maybe in the winter, we'll see, you know, where we're at. Our incidents are so low, I don't know that we'll have to meet in the spring again, but it, or um, in the winter, but definitely in the spring to kind of review how the year went and if we have to update anything. And then this plan needs to be submitted by June, July 1st, I'm sorry, to ISBE. You said that mm -hmm. um, we were probably moving in the direction of the state limiting. Yeah. That's just my opinion, truly. So <laughs> how does that work when you have a combative student right. who is a danger to classmates or mm -hmm. a, and, and you have a teacher who's needing to defend mm -hmm. her students. No, her most students. definitely. And that's just something that I'm thinking is going to be happening because they're giving us a three-year <coughs> period. So Understood. this is over three years. We need to reduce them every year. So part of what we are trying to do then is to have all staff members trained in different techniques to, to try to combat sure. that a little bit. But when we think about right now, we do have a large number of our, our staff, not a large number, a good number of our staff, of our social workers, teachers, peer professionals that are trained in the crisis prevention, which there are allowable holds still. We cannot go prone. That was a few years ago, I'm sure. Um, that was brought to the board's attention. But there are some you know, physical management techniques we still can use. Um, and we are trained in those, and we are refreshing that every year and making sure everybody's up to date on that too. So it's not that it's gone away completely. This is just a plan to kind of look and see where there are ways we can put some things in practice to hopefully reduce that in the future. Now, all our of our teachers, maybe I missed that in what mm -hmm. I was reading, all of our teachers are trained in this? Not in the crisis prevention is the physical management side of it. So our social workers, paraprofessionals, um, our administrators, so like you're saying, there's a combative student that's gonna hurt somebody and we have to put hands on them. Those, every building has a crisis team that they call okay. and, and it handles that situation. Now, the verbal intervention is the training that all staff will go through. Okay. That's coming through our community partnership grant and fits in very nicely with this process and having to have this professional development goal met. Thank you. So a couple things come to mind. One is, uh, and I just need clarification on the assumption. I'm sure. assuming that we had something, a plan like this already in existence, and this is more of an upgrade. Yes. So we did. There is an ISBE form that went to went home. There was not a requirement for a meeting in the past, so that was not part of our process, but will be now, at least the notification of that you can, you know, you can have a meeting, that it should, you know, these things for parents, kind of parent notification of knowing that they have the, re the right to request that. We really haven't said that before, and, and really no district has said that before, so this is why they're kind of, up it is, it's an upgrade. And, and congratulations on the number of uh, incidents, you know, dropping, can you make a direct correlation to why that is occurring, especially in light of the fact that now there's probably a great likelihood for trauma, what, what, why are you having more success? 
Well, I don't know for certain. The year before, I only have last year's data in this year that's based, and we were in the pandemic last year, we were mostly home. <laughs> so I think there was one incident. And then this year, I think that there are great strategies and things being put in place, but I really can't speak to past data to be able to compare it. So I don't know if I can answer your question completely, David, I'm not sure, yeah, but and, and yeah. The reason, and the reason I ask is because, again, pre-pandemic, you know, we did have incidents where there needed to be interventions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess what, the reason I'm asking that question is I'm hoping that whatever successes we're having, mm -hmm. We can definitely make sure that we still have those, we augment those, mm -hmm. so that we, you know, we can continue, like you said, to have those numbers reduced mm -hmm. for the safety of not only the uh, children, but for the safety of the uh, uh, staff. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can I ask um, if I'm reading this slide right, slide 15, that <clears throat> our data shows that in the 21, so 21, 22 school year, that's mostly COVID. So we had a whopping two students at issue. Where are we at this year? So Ballpark. the 21, 22 is two students with four incidents so far this year. Right. Okay. Okay, this, this year. So <clears throat> here's, I guess my concern is whenever we get these rules from the state, right, the state legislature passes these typically in response to something happening elsewhere. And they've given us uh, an objective bright line to meet, a, a reduction of 25% of incidents. Mm -hmm. My concern is um, everything you're doing here is great, but I would not want our administrators to be overly focused on that 25% because right. we're at such low numbers of students right. where that even applies to mm -hmm. the data, the reality of these students just becomes, you know, uh, we could have three students move into the district next year that are incredibly uh, challenging. And over time, I'm sure we will, you know, turn them into good students. But, you know, your numbers could go up since you're at four incidents for the year, right? Mm -hmm. right. You could have two more incidents, and it's a, it's a massive increase, right? And, and um, I get concerned when, when the state, you know, the state wrote that rule, frankly, for somebody else. And I want to make sure that... Um, we're doing everything, all the, all the procedures you lay out here, but mm -hmm. I also don't want teachers to be in a position where they feel like they can't intervene lest the state right. yell at us because we didn't reduce our incidents by 25%. No, definitely. I completely agree with you. No, definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we get that message to the staff? Well, I think when we go through and we talk about when we do the in-person training for the net for the verbal intervention part of it, I think we still talk about and we go through this saying, this is, these are the incidences when we do have to intervene. If a student is harming himself or, or herself or themselves, if they're doing something to someone else, if they're causing you know, a disruption where there is harm that's going to happen. That is still, as I said, none of that has changed as far as the appropriate physical management techniques that we can use. So I think making sure and, and taking your point into account that we do still stress that when we do do our professional development and make sure that staff still understand that. And, and, what and not stressing the reduction as much as the intervention. And what consequences are there if we fail to meet that 25% metric? I don't know, Michael. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's usually, it's usually a strongly worded letter. <laughs> right. Usually it'll come up and, you know, I'll get dinged for okay. something. Or right. the district will get dinged. Audited. Audited, Audited. yeah. Right. Okay. We like to say dinged. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Be good. Thank you, okay. Jane. Thank sure. you. The last discussion item is the consolidated district plan. Not nearly as exciting as not restraining students, but um, our consolidated district plan is the annual precursor to completing all of our grants, uh, which include our Title I, Title II, IDEA, uh, and then our EL grants. Uh, also included this year for the first time in the consolidated district plan is the ESSER II and ESSER III. Uh, we consult with our non-public schools on the title grants. Uh, we do not consult on uh, the ESSER II and, and III with our non-publics, but all of that goes into 
the consolidated district plan so that our goals are aligned, uh, our district initiatives are what we're focusing on for our big rocks for professional development, social studies, culturally responsive teaching and leading standards, all of those things go into the planning. Um, it also leads into our school improvement planning, which is starting next week as we bring our building leadership teams together. Um, and then we will start to complete all of our grants once the district plan is approved. Um, and, and if there's any questions from the state, we'll address those. Right now, our allotments, uh, we've, we've talked about ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, but on the title side, we're a little bit over 328,000 for Title I, a little bit over 68,000 for Title II. Those allotments often change uh, throughout the school year as we get additional funds. They never go down, uh, but we, we typically get an additional surge of uh, Title II in particular uh, somewhere around January. I have a quick question. So, mm -hmm. does this happen annually, or is this? And so, this is not. This is just really a normal sort of thing. Yes, this okay. is the annual plan that we complete before we are allowed to submit any of our grants. So, this uh, this plan is approved, uh, so that it shows connection um, and alignment between all of our our federal grants. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Thank Amber. You. Are there any questions on any of the information items? I just wrote something down. So G, H, I, J, K are all funded from the Community Partnership Grant. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, can you just explain to me where that one and a half social worker again? I can't. I think that was K. Item K is the additional social worker. Where are we putting that person? How, oh, how basically every every elementary gets another half, essentially. Okay. If we add this one. Got it. Okay. So then everyone's at 1.5. Okay. That's really to capture the overflow of you know kids who aren't identified but need a group, need to you know work through some of the trauma pieces that you know we've we keep we've referenced a few times tonight. But I think what we found is that the social workers' caseloads, whether it's because of a special education program or just because of formally identified children becomes pretty full and then they don't have the ability to, you know, whether it's a two, tier two or a tier three child, work with kids who aren't identified to maybe prevent them from being identified in the future. How many social workers do we have currently employed? Well, <coughs> six, uh, How many, how many social workers currently? Across the five buildings. Seven. We have seven. Seven, okay. Yes, we have four elementary buildings. Three. And three apartments, seven, yes. Okay, thank you. For the, uh, just uh, for the pieces like the yoga, like are we rolling, how are we rolling this out to families so that they know this is available to them? Sorry, I'm not talking in the mic. How are we rolling out the pieces that directly Oh, we'll have to, we'll, we'll to end up, it'll be a full blitz with Amy Kent. Okay. Not only mailings, but certainly social media, okay. digital sends, everything. Okay. And we'll, we'll, whatever we can do, we'll cross post to the villages, okay. to the municipal, Wonderful. municipalities, et cetera. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, we're looking forward to Thank it. Thank you for the, launching those. Yeah, these are, this is a really good, really good opportunity for the community. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. If there are no other questions, may I have a motion to move to executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there anything else that follows? There are no more action items for afterwards, so we will not be coming back to take action. We'll come back to adjourn.